welcome back to General Pharmacology. We'll move to the PowerPoint slides and get started. Talk more about central nervous system pharmacology today. During 2.1 neurotransmission, we did an introduction to neurotransmission, and then 2.2 was autonomic pharmacology. And something I said at the beginning of the first central nervous system lecture, and I'll say it again in the beginning of the second central nervous system lecture, is 2.1 neurotransmission and 2.2 autonomic pharmacology are the two lectures that go before these lectures because you're going to need to know neurotransmission and you're going to need to know the autonomic effects of the drugs that we're talking about. So 2.1 neurotransmission and 2.2 autonomic pharmacology, after that it wandered off into the cardiovascular section of medicine because that's a great way to start all that off. However, these lectures, central nervous system pharmacology, again require a review of 2.1 neurotransmission and 2.2 autonomic pharmacology. So if you don't have a really good handle on those lectures, go back and watch the reruns. There are plenty available. And something I showed you in 2.1 neurotransmission was this little picture right here. I didn't explain it because I knew the time would come for me to explain it. Something called a pyramid, shell, pyramid cell and we can't really see the pyramid so well. They have, it, they have it taking up dye and they've taken a very nice slice of this and magnified it very large so we can see this. And so this is the cell body of the pyramid cell and then its axon extends all the way through the spinal cord and terminates at the uh, anterior, the ventral uh, gray of the spinal cord. And these pyramid cells are upper motor neurons. And so what that means in front of your central sulcus is the motor strip of your brain. And that's the area of your brain that signals voluntary muscle movement. And so when a pyramid cell fires, that tells one of the neurons going out to the muscle to move that muscle. And so this is where the words, the pyramidal system comes from. The pyramidal system is based on the fact that those upper motor neurons have little cell bodies that look like pyramids. So that's why we're starting like this. I'm not sure this is in your notes, but that's okay. And so the reason we're talking about this is there are all these things called extrapyramidal movements. And one time when I was talking about extrapyramidal movements, somebody told me, oh, well, their instructor says, we don't use those words anymore. Like, well, that's fine, you know, because they're, they're old uh, by these people who didn't really understand. And, and that's okay. Those people understood pretty well. And the other day I was coming across something, and they are still talking about extrapyramidal movements. So a lot of this is older terminology. However, I hear it used, and I see it used. So that's why we're going through it. And so, again, we start out with that little pyramid-shaped cell, the pyramid-shaped cell. And that's where the pyramidal system comes from. That's how it gets its name. And so that's part of the voluntary muscle system, the upper motor neuron system that commands muscle movement. There's an upper motor neuron that comes from the central nervous system down to the ventral gray. And then the ventral gray of the spinal cord are where the cell bodies of the lower motor neurons go out to the motor units, the actual muscles. And that's all called the pyramidal system. It's because of your voluntary motor system. So when you lose your pyramidal system, you're paralyzed. If you know anything about neuroanatomy, there are places in the brain they call the, the pyramids. And those are just quite simply the axon fibers of the upper motor neuron system, the pyramidal system. And then it gets all ridiculously complicated. That used to be a lot of fun to think about and teach when I was doing that sort of thing. Well, then that gets us to the extrapyramidal system. And extra just means outside of. And so the pyramidal system pertains to voluntary motor movements. The extrapyramidal system has to do with regulation of those movements. And so the extrapyramidal system is about planning those movements, making sure those movements go smoothly, and then checking the actual movements that are occurring and then adjusting those. And so when we talk about, today we're going to talk about extrapyramidal movements, and extrapyramidal movements just suggest some kind of disorder 
of this regulation of movement. And so again, when somebody has a disorder of their pyramidal system, when, the, when they lose their upper motor neurons, they're paralyzed. But when somebody has a disorder of their extrapyramidal system, uh, they have these things called extrapyramidal movements, and we're going to show you what those are. One of the places we see extrapyramidal movements is Parkinson's disease. And we're going to talk about other things like medications that can cause these extrapyramidal movements. But in somebody with Parkinson's disease, it's a disorder of their brain that causes these movements. So Parkinson's disease is a progressive, progressive meaning it gets worse over time. Degenerative meaning these cells will degenerate over time. They'll uh, basically slowly self-destruct over time and disappear. Neurologic as in central nervous system. And it starts out by affecting movement. People who have early Parkinson's disease, the disease will affect their movements. As the disease progresses, as the neurons degenerate, then it can affect more than movement. It can affect mood and thought as well. But we think of Parkinson's disease as a disorder of movement because early in the disease, people can be completely intelligent and have all of their senses. They just have these disorders of movement. Parkinson's disease is a progressive degenerative disease of the basal ganglia. We'll talk about the basal ganglia. It's the C-shaped stuff inside of the brain. And specifically the corpus striatum, the anatomy gets all ridiculously complicated. Uh, something I'll point to right now is everything in the brain that's white matter, those are the axon fibers. And everything in the brain that's gray, that's the collection of cell bodies where they get to together and communicate and then send their signals. Um, ganglia is gray matter inside of the brain. So ganglia is surrounded by white matter. And then you'll know that there is cortex of the brain, and it's called cortex because of tree bark, because that gray matter is on the outside of the brain, specifically the cerebrum and the cerebellum as well. And so ganglia are cell bodies that are within the brain, and cortex is cell body on the outer layer of the brain. And so that's where that ganglia word comes from. Again, Parkinson's disease is a progressive degenerative disease of the basal ganglia of the brain. It gets more complicated than that. And so if you uh, Google any kind of basal ganglia and come up with a picture, uh, this is the basal ganglia right here, this C-shaped stuff. Uh, your brain, as it, mammalian brains, as it evolved, uh, kind of wrapped around in this direction as it curled, and that's where all the C-shaped stuff came from. And the caudate and the globus pallidus, um, caudate, globus pallidus, they make up the basal ganglia. All right. The basal ganglia help the brain regulate motor movement. They help plan motor movement. And so disorders of the basal ganglia result in movements called extrapyramidal movements. Sometimes this will be called the extrapyramidal system. The basal ganglia and their involvement in movement will be called the extrapyramidal system outside of the voluntary uh, muscle system. Uh, some people think of the cerebellum as being part of the extrapyramidal system, and that's fine from a technical point of view. However, clinically, neurologically, if you're looking at older stuff, people who use this sort of terminology, uh, disorders of the ba basal ganglia are what we refer to as extrapyramidal, and it's the disorders of the basal ganglia that result in specific types of extrapyramidal movements. Again, the voluntary system is called the pyramidal system because of that nice pyramid shape we started with. And so damage to the voluntary system results in either weakness, which is uh, paresis, or paralysis, which is a complete loss of uh, motion. Plesia is paralysis. And damage to the basal ganglia of the brain results in the extra damage to the extrapyramidal system which results in extrapyramidal movements, and these are involuntary movements. They cannot control them. So the first thing we see here, and, and your notes should start picking up with the slides pretty well, uh, other than with the new version of this Apple, uh, my videos don't embed anymore, so we have to uh, prevaricate a little bit here.
So these are some of the extrapyramidal movements that we're going to talk about. The first one is a resting tremor. Parkinson's is a typical reason for a resting tremor. There are other reasons, but a resting tremor is a type of extrapyramidal movement. Uh, here is something called a shuffled gait. Shuffle as in quick, short, very short um, steps. In this case, gait is uh, ambulation and, and holding upright. And he also has bradykinesia. He has slow movements overall, but you can see his steps are very short and very shuffled, uh, very quick. And this is called a shuffled gait. And so that's typical in Parkinson's disease. There's other reasons to see these extrapyramidal movements, and we'll talk about them a little bit. But we're talking about Parkinson's, and so uh, somebody with Parkinson's disease, you might see this. And if you look at his hands carefully, you could see the resting tremor. And part of that shuffled gait is because of this impaired postural reflexes. Uh, the motor system isn't set up in such a way that we can quickly respond to changes. And so here we'll do that again with this gentleman, even just a slight uh, touch in the backwards direction, especially uh, backwards. People with neurologic disease as they get older have problems with posture, especially in the reverse direction. You know, they can lean forward and, and move forward okay, uh, but they certainly have problems. Uh, moving backwards and so when you talk about when you talk to a patient about their fall history uh, if it's important to know if they were conscious during the fall uh, and secondly do they have problems maintaining their balance when they're moving backwards uh, because this disorder of movement um, can result in postural reflux problems especially Parkinson's disease Something we see in Parkinson's disease is something called cogwheel rigidity. We'll tell them to relax and we'll take their arm through this passive range of motion and it'll have this cogwheel effect. Uh, choreography is somebody who designs dance and so chorea are these in control dance-like movements. She borders on ballism. You guys can look that up. Uh, but this is a rough description of chorea. Chorea, again, like dance-like movements. We can see this in Parkinson's disease. We can see this in Huntington's disease as well, but today we're talking about Parkinson's disease. Remember the movements of the lip and the tongue, because we're going to come back to that. All right, she has chorea athetosis. Athetosis is snake-like movements, and we'll see it in the fingers and the arms. We'll be able to have this writhing appearance. I'm sorry, here, we'll go back, go back one and see her again. Yeah. So this is chorea athetosis. Choreo as in dancing, athetosis as in the writhing snake-like movements. This lady most likely has Huntington's disease. It's kind of rare to see this much chorioathetosis in somebody with Parkinson's disease. However, these are extrapyramidal movements, and in her situation, this is chorioathetosis. Michael J. Fox is a famous actor. If you watched Back to the Future, you know who Michael J. Fox is, and he has developed Parkinson's disease, and he gave this interview, and you can tell he has a little bit of chorea, uh, more chorea than athetosis, but if you can see the, uh, the, the, the athetotic movements if you watch very carefully. It's not a very good video here. But something he is doing, he's, he's kind of making light of the fact that his Parkinson's disease is a problem until he brushes his teeth and works really hard to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and then uh, once he puts the toothbrush in his mouth, the uh, resting tremor uh, takes care of the rest for him. And so, with Parkinson's disease, we can see the we can see uh, the chorea, the athetosis, and uh, and resting tremor. And so, those will be terms that we use in Parkinson's disease. A tardive dyskinesia is another form of extrapyramidal movement, and we saw this with the lady with chorea. Oh, we'll do that again here, pay better attention. 
So tardive dyskinesia, one of the things that we see is orolingual spasms, oro mouth, lingual tongue, and so we'll see this lip moving, tongue moving, oops, I gotta get better at this, uh, motions. And so orolingual spasm is typical with tardive dyskinesia. We'll see it with people with um, disorders of, we'll see it with Parkinson's disease, but we'll also see this as a toxicity of antipsychotic agents. Blepharospasm, uh, if we watch her eyelids very carefully, hopefully she, uh, blepharo as in eye, eyelids, um, and eyebrows, and you'll see them spasm. And if we go, if you go back and take a look at uh, our example of uh, Coria, she had some blepharospasm, eyelid spasm, and that's pretty typical with tardive dyskinesia. All right, so those are the uh, movement disorders that I had on my slide. And right now we're talking about Parkinson's disease, and one of the things that we'll see is a resting tremor that's different than an intention tremor. People with cerebellar disease, they won't have a resting tremor, uh, but as they try to fine-tune their motion, like that's why you do a finger-nose test, and you know, say, uh, touch your nose, and then my finger, and then your nose, and then my finger, and you want them to do that very quickly, and when they have intention tremor, they have a real hard time getting landing where they want their finger to go. Uh, they can do the gross motor movements, but the fine motor movements are lost. And that can occur with cerebellar disease, so don't confuse intention tremor with resting tremor. Uh, resting tremor is when they are at rest and relax, uh, their hands will tremor. There can be other reasons for this, but Parkinson's disease is a typical reason to see resting tremor. Uh, it occurs while they're awake. It does not occur while they're asleep uh, in the near entirety of situations. Now, it's, after playing all these videos on the computer, the computer's going to tell me I can't play my videos. And then we saw the set gentleman with the shuffled gait uh, and Brady slow kinesia, slow movements. And then we saw impaired postural reflexes. And we'll see that with Parkinson's disease that puts them at a, at a risk for fall. We went through cogwheel rigidity where have them relax and have them go through a passive range of motion and you'll feel this uh, chattering in their extremity and that, that's what a cog wheel is. It's like a ratchet. I, I've only done this like 10 times and it never works. We talked about Coria and if you go back and watch her, she does have blepharospasm. Uh, blepharospasm and orolingual spasm with her chorea. And we took a look at choreoathetosis, choreo dancing, athetosis, snake like movement. Gee, I, I worked so hard for this not to happen today. Uh, and we saw all of that with Michael J. Fox interview. All right, so again, Parkinson's disease is a progressive degenerative disease of the basal ganglia of the brain. And sometimes you'll hear it called corpus striatum, corpus body striatum, um, as in this uh, st alternate striped period. Um, so you'll hear these called striatal tracts if you read about Parkinson's disease. Specifically, what's going on is a loss of neurons in the substantia nigra. That's where Parkinson's disease begins. There's this stuff called black substance in the middle of the brain. It's in the midbrain. And it's uh, these neurons that secrete catecholamines. They have a little bit darker appearance to them. You'll hear them called uh, chromaffin cells, where uh, they have this different appearance to them. And so that substantia nigra has a darker appearance in the brain because those are those collection of cell bodies. They're a little settle set of ganglia, and those ganglia, they use the neurons that they use will secrete dopamine in the basal ganglia. So again, here's my C-shaped stuff, and here is the basal ganglia, and that's what we consider Parkinson's to be a disease of these basal ganglia. And so in the midbrain is this stuff called black substance, substantia nigra, and they're the cell bodies 
of neurons whose axons connect with the basal ganglia. And so here are my little neurons. Hopefully you can see them. There's the cell bodies all collected together. And you'll hear these called the nigrostriatal. Uh, from O2 is how we name things in neurology. And so sometimes when you read about pharmacology, when you read about Parkinson's disease, they'll talk about, talk about a degeneration or a loss of the nigrostriatal pathway. And that nigrostriatal pathway is just quite simply the axons that start in the substantia nigra and go to the basal ganglia. And so the substantia nigra, they use, um, those cell bodies use dopamine. And so that dopamine is being lost in the basal ganglia. Sure, it's these cells that die, but it's the basal ganglia that lose their supply of dopamine. And that loss of supply of dopamine causes the basal ganglia to not function properly, causing these extra pyramidal movements. And again, something that we talked about is that neurons that fire regularly, that's part of their nutrition. That's how neurons stay healthy, and that's how they feed each other and, and supply each other with nutrition. It's through learning and through activity. And so when, even though the disease begins as a failure of neurons in the substantia nigra, that leads to a degeneration of the basal ganglia because they're not getting the neurotransmitter they need uh, from cell bodies that started in the substantia nigra. So you'll hear Parkinson's disease called a disorder of substantia nigra. You'll hear Parkinson's disease referred to as a basal ganglia, a disease of the basal ganglia. You'll hear Parkinson's re disease referred to as a failure of the, ni ni uh, the nigrostriatal pathway. And that's basically where this terminology is coming from if, if you read carefully about any of that stuff. All right, so Parkinson's disease patients, they have a loss of substantia nigra neurons. And these neurons use dopamine. So the treatment to treat Parkinson's, the, the strategy to treat Parkinson's disease is to either directly or indirectly provide dopamine agonism. And then the basal ganglia also uh, have neurons that rely on acetylcholine. And sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, Huntington's disease, it's the opposite of Parkinson's disease. It's not really the opposite. It's, it's really a more severe form of disease because of a failure of the acetylcholine system. And so that's how Parkinson's and Huntington's is similar. But Parkinson's is through this loss of dopamine. And so we're going to raise dopamine levels, either directly or indirectly. And then based on the results that we get, um, or their symptoms that they're presenting with, uh, we're either going to raise acetylcholine levels or we're going to use uh, acetylcholine blockers. And so keep that in mind with Parkinson's disease, that even though uh, dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter that we're trying to deal with, one of the other important, neuro the other important neurotransmitter in the um, basal ganglia is acetylcholine. All right. Well, Eventually, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. And something interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that the pathology that we see when we see these changes in the neurons, well, they don't necessarily lead to Alzheimer's disease. So some of the things that we classically think of as Alzheimer's disease, well, we can see those things in an animal model, and they'll be fine. They don't have dementia. And so Alzheimer's disease, we're having a lot of difficulty with because the pathology, the neuropathology, doesn't match the symptoms, especially in the animal model. And so, well, we had the same problem in Parkinson's disease. Up through the 1980s, we weren't sure if the death of the uh, um, substantia nigra was the cause of Parkinson's disease. There's other Parkinsonian-like movement disorders, and we weren't quite sure until the MPTP incident occurred in the 80s. And so somewhere in the 1980s, uh, there was a group of um, youth in Southern California, and they got their hands on a, a drug that was synthesized by a bathtub chemist, an amateur chemist. And so on a side note, don't do drugs even when they're made by major manufacturers. Uh, but people who make drugs, 
uh, that work on your central nervous system when they make them in the comfort of their own shed, uh, maybe they're going to come up with something that is incredibly poisonous. And if you read very carefully, uh, that occurs uh, more often than people realize because there's all this other stuff in the headlines that I guess is more important. So in the 80s, these people got their hands on this, uh, this poison. The chemist, the bathtub chemist, thought he was making Demerol, a uh, type of narcotic analgesic. So these people thought they were going to get some heroin high from this drug that he was making. Uh, but what that drug was full of is MPTP. And this MPTP is a brain poison. Uh, and our friend monoamine oxidase took the MPTP and turned it into a toxin that was selectively taken up by the substantia nigra and causing cell death. And so when this happened, we quickly realize that it is the death of substantia nigra that leads to Parkinson's disease because these good guys uh, and gals that got their hands on this bathtub Demerol, they were poisoned with this MPTP and they developed a very rapid progressive form of Parkinson's disease. And I met one of these uh, people when I was um, when I was in clinical practice. Well, what had happened is that this led us to realize that not only MPTP was the cause of Parkinson's, or not that, that the loss of substantia nigra caused Parkinson's disease, but MPTP can be used to create an animal model for Parkinson's disease, and that's something that we have not had with Alzheimer's disease. And so because we can take uh, rodents like mice or rats, we can give them MPTP and give mammals, uh, since mammals have very similar brains, because we can induce a type of Parkinson's disease in them, then we have uh, a very, uh, we have a resource to study new medications for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And so if you read the pharmacology of Parkinson's disease, uh, certain medications, uh, they will say they were developed from the MPTP animal model. And so that's why we talk about this, because MPTP uh, led us to realize conclusively that it was the death of the substantia nigra neurons and the loss of dopamine in the basal ganglia that led to Parkinson's disease that we know of and it allowed us to create an animal model to develop new treatments for Parkinson's disease. Again, our strategies to treat uh, Parkinson's disease is to increase dopamine levels and then balance that out with acetylcholine, either directly, indirectly uh, raising acetylcholine and or, or blocking uh, acetylcholine receptors. All right, so some anti-Parkinsonian drugs that can either directly or indirectly lead to a dopamine agonism is um, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, specifically uh, monoamine oxidase type B, and this is uh, more clearly outlined in your resources section. A catechol O methyltransferase inhibitors as well will be used to treat uh, Parkinson's disease, and we'll talk about that in a second. So remember, from neurotransmission, it was monoamine oxidase and catechol O methyltransferase that broke down the catecholamines. And so, if we prevent the breakdown of catecholamines, we can increase catecholamine levels. Dopamine precursors, specifically L-dopa, uh, the L-dopa, the same L-dopa that was the miracle drug in the movie Awakenings, that story by Oliver J. Sacks. Uh, L-dopa is a mainstay of Parkinson's treatment. Uh, dopa decarboxylase inhibitors will go with the L-dopa to prevent the body from breaking the dopa down, or actually prevent the peripheral conversion of L-dopa to dopamine. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then when we talk about the ergot alkaloids, we'll talk about dopamine agonists as well. We'll talk more about the ergot alkaloids when we talk about section 3.3, but the dopamine agonists that we use as anti-Parkinsonian agents, the direct agonists are ergot alkaloids. So despite all the exciting things that we are doing 
with Parkinson's disease, uh, Cinemet remains a mainstay of treatment. And again, uh, that Cinemet is a combination drug of L-DOPA, levodopa. Uh, remember, uh, DOPA started out as phenylalanine, and then the DO uh, stood for dihydroxyphenylalanine. So you start with phenylalanine, and then you make tyrosine, and then you hydroxylate that tyrosine, and now you have L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is a precursor for dopamine. And so for a very long time, we've known that L-DOPA uh, helped with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, among other things. Well, one of the problems is that DOPA decarboxylase is an enzyme that turns the L-DOPA into dopamine, and that happens in the brain, and that's a good thing. However, if we, when we swallow the L-DOPA, there are, there's DOPA decarboxylase all through the blood, the peripheral system, and the tissues that break down the L-DOPA, actually convert the L-DOPA to dopamine before it even gets into the brain. And that causes all sorts of problems that we don't want. And so we'll use carbidopa to prevent the breakdown of L-DOPA in the body. Uh, we're going to prevent L-DOPA from being converted to dopamine in the body because we're giving them L-DOPA, we give it to them by mouth, but we want the L-DOPA to enter the brain and then be converted into dopamine in the brain. And so that's why we'll use carbidopa to prevent that breakdown of the L-DOPA, prevent that L-DOPA being converted to dopamine in the body, which is then immediately broken down into its uh, byproducts. And so we use the carbidopa to prevent the peripheral breakdown, prevent the peripheral conversion of the L-DOPA to the dopamine. So Cinemet is a combination of these two drugs and still the mainstay of a Parkinson's disease. Yeah, again, with the, without the carbidopa, the levodopa is quickly broken down and does not enter the brain. It's converted into the dopamine and then the dopamine is broken down and, and does not enter the brain. And so the, the carbidopa prevents the L-DOPA. The carbidopa allows the L-DOPA to get into the brain uh, before it's metabolized. We'll talk about the ergot alkaloids in 3.3. Uh, something called bromocryptine is an anti-Parkinsonian agent. It's also called Parlidel. And it can be used in Parkinson's disease. It is used to treat Parkinson's disease. However, uh, the most likely reason that you see somebody on bromocryptine, Parlidel, is to treat a type of pituitary adenoma uh, called a prolactinoma. And you'll see women who have uh, breast milk secretion for no reason and they'll come to the doctor and maybe we'll be smart enough to get a brain scan and we'll realize that they have a pituitary adenoma. And the, it's a benign occurrence. It's a benign tumor. Uh, and we don't need to do anything about it other than give them some medication. And Parlidel works quite well at controlling the symptoms of um, uh, uh, the pituitary adenoma that secretes excessive uh, prolactinoma, prolactinemia. And so uh, bromocryptine parlidel is given to women to control that, and you're going to see that's going to be much more common than using bromocryptine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent. And again, you'll have people who you'll see bromocryptine on their drug list, and you're just like, oh, well, do you have Parkinson's disease? It's an anti-Parkinsonian agent. And they're like, no, I have, I have a prolactinoma and symptoms from that. And so, again, that's why we talk about it in central nervous system pharmacology, because everything you read will describe bromocryptine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent because it is an, a dopamine agonist. Something else I want you to keep in mind with the ergot alkaloids is the different ergot alkaloids have different effects on different receptors. Bromocryptine has a specific effect on dopamine receptors. The other ergot alkaloids have different effects on different receptors like serotonin receptors. So I don't want you to be under the mistaken impression that ergot alkaloids are dopamine agonists. Uh, bromocryptine is a dopamine agonist and it came from the ergots. I used to talk about the ergots first, uh, now I talk about the ergots next time. And then we talked about a we talked about the cholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholinesterase is the drug is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So cholinesterase inhibitors increase acetylcholine levels. And so if we feel like we're getting too much anticholinergic effect from the drugs, we can use cholinesterase inhibitors.
and then we can use uh, anti-muscarinic drugs if we feel like we're getting too much cholinergic effect. A Benadryl is an antihistamine. We talked about it a little bit. We'll talk about it in histamine, serotonin, and the ergot alkaloids. Benadryl, diphenhydramine, has anticholinergic effects. And again, I used to talk about that first, but we're going to talk about that next time. And so, yeah, the same Benadryl that we use as an antihistamine, the same Benadryl that we'll use as a sleep agent, it's the same Benadryl that we can use as an anticholinergic drug. And then uh, you see that little atropine word in there, atropine, and in this case it's a synthetic form, benztropine. That's what cogentin is. Cogentin is an anticholinergic drug more commonly used with uh, Parkinson's disease and then uh, antipsychotic toxicity as well. So be on the lookout uh, for these drugs being used as anticholinergic drugs in Parkinson's disease. I picked up a drug guide a while back and it described diphenhydramine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent and so I'm sure that causes plenty of confusion and that's why we learn pharmacology with its clinical pharmacology how it works on receptors rather than say oh this drug does this and that drug does that because a lot of drugs have a lot of different effects that are used in a lot of different situations. Let's talk about psychosis. Uh, there's a difference between neurosis and psychosis. I think one of your assignments is to try to figure out the difference between neurosis and psychosis. <coughs> and the bottom line is neurosis is a mental illness that interferes with a person's capacity, but uh, they can still get through life with neurosis. Psychosis uh, means that they cannot get through their day-to-day -day activities because of the mental illness. Here the definition, mental illness that markedly interferes with a person's capacity to meet life's everyday demands. Their activities of daily living. Neurosis interferes with that. Uh, psychosis makes activities of daily living nearly impossible. Psychosis, we'll talk about uh, being a disorder of thought uh, where reality is grossly impaired. Again, the book by Oliver J. Sacks goes into this in depth and uh, that's something to uh, consider. However, in, on the YouTube channel, and I'll try to remember to put this in your resources section, but there is a playlist in, on the YouTube channel that's called Schizophrenia, and those are videos from YouTube that are actual schizophrenic patients, I assure you, uh, being interviewed by uh, experts in the field. And so uh, when I have a face-to-face -face class, we sit and watch videos of people with schizophrenia, uh, a, a disease that causes psychosis. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to have psychosis. A lot of reasons our patients can have psychosis. Uh, one of the most common reasons is alcohol and delirium tremens. And we're not going to talk too much about that in here, but there is a place in your resources section for that. People come to the hospital, uh, they'll sit at home and they'll drink a 12-pack every day, anywhere from a 6-pack to a 12-pack every day. And it doesn't even take that much. There are people who can just drink a little bit every day and they stop drinking. They're going to have alcohol withdrawal. And it's much more common in the hospital than I think people realize that. So they drink a lot at home, and they drink on a regular basis, and then they come to the hospital for some protracted stay, and of course they're like, well, no, I don't drink it. I don't drink much at all, maybe, maybe two beers a day. And, and they're lying because nobody really wants to tell the nurse, you know, our good, perfect nurse, we, we don't want to tell her that we, we sit at home and drink all day. And so they don't. They don't tell that they are an alcoholic. That is very hard for people to admit to as it is, certainly not if they're in there for some kind of emergency or some kind of surgery. So they'll say, oh no, I don't drink. And after a couple of days of sitting in the hospital and listening to all the noise all night long and all the bells and whistles and dings, and uh, they start becoming psychotic because of this reason right here, delirium tremens, alcohol withdrawal. And so countless times I've seen patients I become psychotic and people think, oh, it's some kind of stroke or some kind of re reaction to medication. They'll start looking, all these reasons to be psychotic. And there's a reason that this is number one on the list, alcohol withdrawal. People drink regularly, they stop drinking for about 72 hours, two to three days, uh, somewhere right in there, and they start to be psychotic. And this can be a life and death situation, not only for the patient, but the other patients in the hospital and the people working in the hospital if this is not taken care of properly. Uh, bipolar disorders, tumors, epilepsy as well, the, the seizure disorders that we talked about, we talked about them as being a disorder of movements. Uh, 
Um, when there are convulsions, however, they can also uh, cause disorders of thought as well. And so keep that in mind. I've seen people that were just so depressed, so profoundly depressed that they start to have psychotic features. Any of the disorder, the mood, any of the disorders of mood, whether anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, they can be so severe that they start to have psychotic features as well, where there is a, a complete disorder of the thought. A dementia, of especially Alzheimer's disease, stroke, all of these things can result in psychosis. But today we're going to talk about schizophrenia, which is a disease process that leads to psychosis. So schizophrenia is a disorder of the brain resulting in thought disorder involving delusions and hallucinations, disorganized speech and behavior. I used to try to imitate schizophrenic patients, but again, the YouTube channel has a playlist of patients who are schizophrenic being interviewed, and, and I would urge you to take a look at that. If you are uh, in a large metroplex area with a large homeless population, this is a major reason for homelessness. When you think of the homeless population, uh, you think it's all one reason because they don't have a home, and that's erroneous. There are people who are homeless because they've come on hard economic times and, and they need help. Uh, there are people who are homeless because they want to be and they need help. But there are people who are homeless for this reason right here. They're schizophrenic and they don't have the mental faculties to carry out their activities of day-to-day -day living. Um, in the 40s up to the 40s and 50s, these people, we used to keep them in an institution, uh, but after deinstitutionalization, and there's really no place for these people to go. And so uh, one of the uh, places you'll see schizophrenia is just out on the streets. Uh, so schizophrenia, uh, we use antipsychotic agents to treat schizophrenia and psychosis and other uh, behavioral disturbances. And that reminds me of a slide that's missing, uh, but it's in your, uh, it's in your clinical discussion. All right, so we're talking about antipsychotic medications. And we're going to use the antipsychotic medications, especially to treat schizophrenia. There are other reasons to treat, anti uh, treat uh, patients with antipsychotic agents. Now, again, just because we're using an antipsychotic agent doesn't mean that that person is psychotic. Sure, we're going to use these to treat, treat schizophrenia, uh, but there are other reasons to use antipsychotic agents as well that have nothing to do with schizophrenia. You might come across a person who has depression and they take a medication uh, that would be classified as an antipsychotic. Uh, there might be people who are on a certain medication that markedly interferes with their sleep. And so they might take an antipsychotic medication to help them sleep and help them stabilize their mood as well. The traditional antipsychotic agents were uh, called dopamine antagonists, and we can call them dopamine receptor type 2 and dopamine receptor type 4. This is the traditional way we've categorized things. The more we learn about this, the more we realize that these uh, antipsychotic agents have mixed action on other receptors as well. The more we study things, the more we realize they're very complicated. Uh, however, we still need a simple way of describing them, and early on, uh, the original antipsychotics were described as D2 blockers. One of the problems with the dopamine receptor type 2 blockers is they caused extrapyramidal symptoms. All right, so this is the point of the lecture today. Remember, Parkinson's disease is due to a loss of dopamine. All right, so Parkinson's patients have extrapyramidal symptoms, extrapyramidal movements, because of a loss of dopamine. Now here's somebody with schizophrenia taking a dopamine receptor blocker. They have extrapyramidal symptoms as well because of the medication. And so the movements that we traditionally look at and say, well, that's Parkinson's disease. We're also going to see these in patients who are taking antipsychotic agents. Now, there are subtle differences between them, but again, they're still the extrapyramidal movements. And so that's where I want you to see the connection uh, between Parkinson's disease and those symptoms, which is a loss of dopamine, and then the extrapyramidal movements that we see in a schizophrenic uh, because of treatment with drugs that are blocking dopamine.
Well, now we have new, newer type of uh, dopamine receptor blockers. We'll call those the D4 blockers. And they're newer. They have less extra pyramidal symptoms. And so if our schizophrenic is having a lot of, uh, maybe they're having tardive dyskinesia and we want less tardive dyskinesia, maybe we can use a D4 blocker instead. Oh, but that all gets very complicated. All right, first of all, these antipsychotic medications are especially dangerous in the elderly who have dementia, like Alzheimer's disease. Somebody with Alzheimer's disease, they get severe Alzheimer's disease, and somewhere around sunset, sundowners, uh, they start to get psychotic, and we thought, oh, giving them these new antipsychotic agents will be helpful, and we quickly, quickly realized uh, that there is an increased risk of death in the elderly patients that have dementia that's related to, I'm sorry, that have psychosis that's due to their dementia. And so be very careful using the antipsychotic agents in elderly patients with dementia. I think I mentioned this. Sure, we used to call them dopamine antagonists, but actually they have all sorts of actions on other receptors as well because, you know, when I teach it, it's like, well, this is the one receptor. You know, I have a cartoon of, you know, one receptor, and, and it responds to this, and, and we just think of all the receptors working that way. But actually, there are countless subtypes of dopamine receptors, countless serotonin subtype receptors, and so there's all sorts of different types of serotonin receptors, and the medications work on those different receptors in a different manner. Uh, I was reading something the other day that described the antipsychotic agents into potencies, uh, high potency, they'll have more extrapyramidal effects, and they'll be less sedating, and they'll also, ha also have less uh, peripheral alpha blocking, meaning less orthostatic hypotension, um, and less anticholinergic effects as well. However, some of the newer ones, they're going to have a less extrapyramidal effects, and that might be a good thing. However, they can be more sedating, they can have more orthostatic hypotension, and they can have more anticholinergic effects as well, more mouth, more like dry mouth is what that's supposed to say, dry mouth. All right. So that's something to keep in mind when we're taking care of a, a psychotic patient or using psychotic medications, that when we get less of one thing, uh, we end up with more of something else. And so some of the antipsychotic medications today are, are, are very sedating to the point where we'll, we'll use them quite simply to help people sleep. We'll use them as a, a hypnotic uh, to help them sleep. All right, phenothiazines were the original antipsychotic agents. Chlorpromazine is thorazine. It was considered a low potency antipsychotic agent. Flufenazine is prolixin and it was considered a high potency. What, what I want you to know about flufenazine, I think they've done away with the trade name, although we'll call it prolixin. If you practice with this population, uh, you might hear people call it prolixin. The great thing about flufenazine is it can be used intramuscularly. And so I used to work in a clinic where we had plenty of psychotic patients, and we would uh, give them uh, flufenazine intramuscularly. You can give them anywhere from like once a month to once every six weeks. We had excellent results from the flufenazine, especially when you saw what happened when they stopped taking the flufenazine. So if you deal with the homeless population, if you are involved in the homeless population and public health, uh, you might find yourself using flufenazine in that population. Uh, it's an excellent drug to use in uh, populations where they don't have the ability to be very compliant. Haldol is one of the older antipsychotic agents. Uh, there's all sorts of new antipsychotic agents today. And like Seroquel, most of the reasons that you'll see people take Seroquel, Seroquel or Respiradol is to help them sleep. Maybe they have a uh, reason, a disorder of mood, where they have to take a certain medication. That certain medication keeps them awake at night. We can add some Seroquel or Respiradol, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, to help them with sleep. And so the, the reason I make this point is that, sure, these are listed as antipsychotic agents. Sure, we list them as dopamine antagonists, although we know they have other effects as well. And I don't want you to get in the habit of meeting a patient and looking at their drug list and saying, oh, they're on it. You know, you look up the drug and it says it's an antipsychotic agent. And then you just assuming that patient has psychosis.
because there are other reasons that we use these medications, but we still classify them as antipsychotic agents. Abilify is commonly used to treat depression, even though it's listed as an antipsychotic agent. And just the other day, someone was asking me about, well, I, th I thought I was taking it for depression, and now I read that it's an antipsychotic agent. And I'm like, well, they're, they're just trying to make things more complicated for those of you in pharmacology classes and patients who read the drug labels. And again, it, you can say that it has, it's a dopamine antagonist, but it has all sorts of mixed activity as well. And again, because the antipsychotic agents block dopamine, antipsychotic agents can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. And so you'll see this in the homeless population. Maybe uh, the person has schizophrenia and they are getting some kind of antipsychotic agent and then they start developing a tremor, a resting tremor. Maybe they have bradykinesia and a shuffled gait. And it's not because they have Parkinson's disease, it's because of the dopamine blocking effect of their anti-Parkinsonian agents. Antipsychotic agents can cause Parkinsonian-like symptoms, an um, uh, extrapranal movement called an acute dystonic reaction, acute meaning it comes on very quickly, and dystonic, dys, something wrong, tonic as in tone, reaction, and we'll see, what do I have here? Yeah, dystonic reactions are adverse extrapyramidal effects that occur shortly after the initiation of a neuroleptic drug. Uh, neuroleptic drug is another word for antipsychotic agent. There are other drugs that can be considered neuroleptic, but traditionally neuroleptic drugs are considered antipsychotic agents. And so we can have these dystonic reactions. And so uh, somebody, especially if it's the first time they've ever gotten the medication, we need to be on the lookout for a dystonic reaction where they'll stiffen up, and they won't be able to move. Uh, either it in intermittent or sustained involuntary spasm contractions of the body and especially the face, and, and they'll be contorted, and they'll look terrible. It can be very scary. They're not life-threatening, but they're very scary, and if we treat them quickly using an anticholinergic agent, uh, the same ones that we'll use in Parkinson's disease, then, then we can treat them. IV Benadryl works great for acute dystonic reactions. We can give them oral Benadryl as well. It just takes a lot longer to work as long as they can actually swallow. Uh, Benztropine can just, uh, cogentin can be used for acute dystonic reactions as well. Something I want you to keep in mind as we move forward is some of the nausea drugs, the anti-emetic drugs, are based on the antipsychotic agents and so they can also result in acute dystonic reactions and so you might see that with certain nausea drugs and we'll come back and talk about that when we talk about nausea. Please do not use dopamine drugs when treating acute dystonic reactions. The answer is anticholinergics. So that's wrong. Uh, I showed you th the lady having tardive dyskinesia, mouth and tongue spasm. That's oral lingual spasms and then eyelid spasms. That's called blepharospasm. And I showed you this lady at, uh, early on. Uh, having anti, uh, tardive dyskinesia and hers is due to antipsychotic effects. But again, it's an extra pyramidal movement that is very similar to what you'll see in, in patients uh, with Parkinson's disease. Um, tardive dyskinesia, maybe it's helpful to get rid of some of the other anticholinergic drugs they're on, or maybe we can switch them to a newer antipsychotic agent. Maybe we can use benzodiazepines as well in the treatment and prevention of tardive dyskinesia. Uh, the other effects that we can expect is sedation and uh, making them relaxed and sleepy and, and uh, go to sleep, and then low blood pressure, uh, especially. Uh, by alpha blockade and orthostatic hypotension. So that's one of the things we worry about with the newer antipsychotic major, uh, agents is this orthostatic hypotension, low blood pressure. Antipsychotic agents can also cause neuroleptic, again neuroleptic is another word for antipsychotic agent, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Malignant here is another word. Uh, that does, another is situation where malignant doesn't mean cancer, malignant means organ damage. And so neuroleptic malignant syndrome has nothing to do with cancer. It has to do with the 
the neuroleptic medication affecting the brain in such a way that the brain is not able to regulate its autonomic nervous system and that results in hyper high thermia temperature uh, high enough temperature to uh, cause uh, brain injury and death uh, rigidity autonomic dysregulation and, and can uh, cause all sorts of problems including uh, coma and death Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the brain that results in dementia. Mentia as in mind, D as in without. And so people who have dementia, they have a loss of memory, pattern recognition. Uh, I'll see if I can get some interviews for you of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And it's due to an irreversible progressive degenerative process of brain cells, especially the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. Quite frankly, we don't really have a clear a pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So they'll have a loss of cognitive functions, cognitive as in the functioning of the brain, uh, especially how we interpret and process information. So they'll have a loss of memory. It can also affect their movement and the coordination, uh, recognition, recognition, judgment, and reasoning are all symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is not reversed. It can be slowed. It cannot be stopped. And so the drugs we're using today, Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, these are cholinesterase inhibitors, but they're more specific for the brain. However, we will expect autonomic effects from the use of these drugs. And so I want you to keep that in mind and take a look at that. Uh, but cholinesterase inhibitors uh, slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And that's all they do. They don't, they don't, they don't cure it. They don't stop it, but they do, they have been shown to slow the progression of Alzheimer's uh, over time. And then people with Alzheimer's disease, we can use uh, antidepressants, especially uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And then they're going to have sort of behavioral problems, especially around sunset. That's called sunsetting. And they'll have behavioral problems. Maybe uh, we'll select an antipsychotic agent for them. Maybe we'll use benzodiazepines. Uh, but the problem is the benzodiazepines are poorly metabolized in the elderly and increase their risk of fall. And antipsychotic agents come with a black box warning telling us that they have an increased risk of death for whatever reason when we use them in Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is very difficult to treat. And that's why we have Alzheimer's units with people who specialize in taking care of an Alzheimer's patient. Because even though the medication can slow the progression, uh, their treatment is, is very much uh, a social uh, interaction, uh, very much a social dynamic to the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, uh, much less so than pharmacology. All right, let's talk about the endorphins and the opiate receptors. Uh, you have these naturally occurring peptides, uh, oligopeptides in your brain, these short peptide chains, and they naturally regulate pain. And they work on something we would call endorphin receptors, but we call them opiate receptors because opium acts upon those receptors. So your brain makes endorphins that work on opiate receptors. And these are naturally occurring substances, the endorphins are, and the opiate receptors, and they help you manage pain. They help you regulate pain. Uh, the opiates are a class of drug um, very similar to morphine. Morphine is one of the opiates uh, that can be derived from opium, and, and it's been around forever and, and has been known to relieve severe pain with uh, maximum efficacy. Uh, back in the day when um, the forums, the clinical discussion, was a big free-for-all, uh, people would tell us very carefully how morphine was purified from opium, uh, the poppy seeds. And so uh, you might want to take a look at how this is done because um, not so that you can do it, but you can see how easy it is for producers in Asia to uh, make this and ship this out. Uh, you might want to look up the Opium Wars of the late 1800s, uh, the mid-1800s. Anyway, uh, morphine got its name, even though it's an opiate, it got its name from Morpheus, uh, the Greek god of dreams. Uh, stuff, uh, curiosities from our uh, clinical discussions over the years.
All right, morphine and the opiate analgesics and the opioid analgesics. There's a difference between opiate and opioid if you can find somebody who really knows the difference. Uh, but something they all have in common is analgesia. Uh, algesia is pain and is without. So analgesic agents relieve pain. Euphoria is the feeling of just feeling perfect, feeling wonderful. And so this is why the opiates are so addictive is because of this right here. They make a lot of people, they just feel great when they take them. If we can come up with an opiate that gives us maximum analgesia without any euphoria, then I think we'll solve uh, one of the uh, main problems that uh, we have in pain control in, in this country. Uh, sedation and uh, hypnosis, putting people to sleep, is another problem with morphine or one of the effects of morphine. It can cause respiratory depression, take out their drive to breathe. We can give somebody so much of an opiate that it becomes a central nervous system depressant where their breathing systems uh, quit working. And so that's how people die from, opi uh, from opiate overdose. Uh, some of these medicines, they end up in, in cough suppressants. They end up in cough medicines because one of the opiate receptors is involved in cough, and so uh, opiates make excellent drugs for cough suppression. Uh, something you'll notice if you watch the movies very quickly, sometimes uh, one of the actors uh, will be, maybe they have cancer, maybe they're getting opiate treatments for that, maybe they're using opiates for other reasons, and so opiates lead to pinpoint pupils, which is called meiosis, and I mean pinpoint. And so you'll be able to identify this in the clinical setting. Somebody will come in and they say, oh, I need a refill for whatever drug. And they say, well, when was the last time you had that? And they're like, oh, maybe it was a long time ago. And they'll have teeny, teeny, tiny pinpoint pupils. And so anybody who uses an opiate analgesic and you see them, you're going to want to document this right here if you see them have pinpoint pupils. All right, uh, something else that's a problem for a lot of patients who take the opiates they have nausea and vomiting. Demerol is an opiate analgesic, and it's notorious for causing nausea and vomiting, and so that's why it's mixed with Phenergan routinely. You'll say, oh, Demerol with Phenergan. The Demerol is for pain. The Phenergan is to prevent this right here. One of the problems with the pain medications is they cause constipation, and this is especially problematic in somebody who has, who's had bowel surgery or any kind of surgery and the surgery stresses their bowels out to where they start to slow down or even come to a stop, which is ileus. And then they have pain, and we give them pain medication, and, and that makes their bowels slow down even more, it makes it harder for them to start up. And so this is why post-operative patients are very difficult to deal with because well, they have pain, and we have to give them pain control uh, because not controlling their pain uh, some people consider to be a form of torture, and so we have to control their pain aggressively, and yet it makes their bowels move uh, even more slowly than they're moving already, and treating pain aggressively can lead to addiction. So we have, there's a careful balance between pain control and uh, preventing addiction. Uh, one of the other things that morphine is notorious in, in the opiate analgesics is uh, to make people itchy. That's called pruritus. And it's not because of some disorder in the skin or histamine release. It's these uh, areas of the brain that sense this uh, need to scratch. And so I had a surgery and they were giving me morphine, which I do not like at all. And it caused me nausea, vomiting, and lots of itching. Something else that's not on here is pulmonary edema. You can write that pulmonary edema. Somebody comes to the emergency room, they've overdosed on heroin, uh, they might even be foaming at the mouth because of the pulmonary edema, the fluid buildup in the lungs. Uh, one of the problems I had, every time I got morphine, I couldn't breathe because of uh, this pulmonary edema. And so uh, th that was before my surgery when I made these slides. So you can put pulmonary edema on there as well. Uh, we can divide the opiate agonists into strong and, and weak, and I don't think that's too useful, but some people like to do that. Morphine, uh, hydromorphone, uh, oxymorphone. Uh, heroin is just quite simply an opiate prodrug. Uh, heroin's not 
effective until it passes through uh, the liver. Methadone is a mixed agonist antagonist. You'll see that with some of the newer uh, analgesics is they have a mixed action. So it's harder to overdose on them. It's hard to get excessive doses. Uh, something with methadone, somebody who is a an heroin addict uh, will give them methadone as a substitute because it has antagonistic effects. Uh, fentanyl is available as a duragesic patch um, and we try to use that exclusively in patients with cancer uh, but more and more we're seeing these drugs abused uh, to the point where it's become a national emergency. Uh, fentanyl, there is, uh, I think it's called carfentanyl and it's coming from overseas. It's a synthetic uh, opiate that's designed for elephants and they're mixing that in with the heroin and other uh, drugs of abuse and it's also leading to uh, a national crisis as if we don't have enough. A codeine is an opiate agonist, not quite the, uh, the efficacy of the others. And when you see something called Tylenol number three or Tylenol number something in the United States, it's called Tylenol number three. It's just quite simply a mixture with, of codeine with acetaminophen. Uh, hydrocodone is uh, Vicodin. Uh, oxycodone is Percocet. And you'll often see these uh, opiate agonists, these opioid analgesics, they're mixed with Tylenol. One of the reasons they mix them with Tylenol is they, or acetaminophen, they'll have APAP after na their name. APAP -P is an abbreviation for acetaminophen. And you'll see these opiate analgesics, though, they're mixed with Tylenol for two reasons. One of the reasons they mix them with the acetaminophen, the Tylenol, is that supposedly that helps give them a better effect. But the other reason that they do that um, is something called denaturing. If you look at fuel alcohol from the hardware store, it's made of pure ethanol, uh, the kind that you would drink. Uh, however, they put poison in it. They put methanol in it so that you'll, that you'll get injured if you drink it because uh, they don't want you drinking the ethanol from the hardware store. And that originally started out as an issue with taxation that when you dry out, buy alcohol to drink, you have to pay a lot of taxes on that. And when you buy alcohol to burn in a camper stove, well, you don't pay taxes on that. And so they started putting poisons in the ethanol that you use in a camper stove, uh, mainly because of tax reasons. And secondly, so that you don't abuse it um, without you know, going to the liquor store and paying taxes. They started doing this with the analgesics as well. They put Tylenol in them to decrease the ability to separate them out and abuse them. And so the Tylenol is quite literally there to cause toxicity rather than just more use the drug more and more and more. And I've seen patients who took these drugs, uh, in the, took the opioid analgesics in combination with Tylenol, and they had to use them so often that they started to get uh, liver damage from the acetaminophen. And so keep that in mind. If you have a patient who needs pain control and you're using an opioid analgesic that is in combination with acetaminophen and then they're using Tylenol on the side as it is, then you need to be very careful about them having acetaminophen toxicity. And so this is one of the other problems that we're seeing with the opioid crisis, the opiate crisis going on in our country is that people are getting, uh, it's bad enough that these substances are addictive, uh, but we're also causing liver damage by putting them in combination with acetaminophen. So it's a very tight rope to walk, giving people who need pain control appropriate pain control and preventing people who are abusing the medications uh, preventing them from getting it. But the last person I heard talk about it say, you know, if we could come up with a great pain control drug that causes no euphoria, then we'll be in a lot better shape. Uh, something recently going on, and we'll talk about that later, is, is use of Tylenol IV. It is available as in an injective and in injection form as well. All right, uh, Narcan is naloxone. This is what you want to learn. If you've, if you've learned nothing else from the last hours and 10 minutes, I know that Narcan naloxone is used to reverse the effects of opiates. It's very safe. Its effect is immediate. 
We can use it IV. Now they have nasal sprays as well. And that they're making that more and more available for first responders. And so if you work in an emergency room, somebody comes in unconscious, it might be policy there to give them uh, naloxone immediately because heroin overdose is the most likely reason for someone to come into your emergency room unconscious. Uh, so be aware of that. You know, with, with romazacon, flumazenil, it can cause seizures, and so we're very cautious about using that drug to reverse benzodiazepines. Sometimes we're just better off uh, giving them respiratory support and letting them uh, just metabolize, metabolize the benzodiazepines. Uh, but Narcan works immediately, and it's safe to use. And so uh, Narcan is becoming an essential drug in the treatment of uh, opioid addiction. Something I want you to keep in mind is the effect is dramatic. I used to have a, a video on YouTube. It's not there anymore. Uh, where And this was on the Discovery Channel where somebody had come into the emergency room with uh, unconscious from an overdose. And as soon as they got, they gave him Narcan, he woke up and became very violent and got up and started beating people up and tearing up the emergency room. And I know from personal experience that it is incredibly rare for anyone to wake up from an overdose and say, oh, thank you for saving my life. Uh, the near entirety of overdose patients that I have taken up, uh, taken care of, as soon as they were awake and able to move, uh, they would get up and be very angry and start ripping out their IVs, essentially because they're starting to have withdrawal signs. Uh, just waking them up causes them to have symptoms of withdrawal. And so one of the very difficult things with taking care of these people is they'll be laying there completely unconscious and you give them Narcan and the next thing you know, uh, the effect is dramatic and they're up tearing things up. And so it might be a good idea. Uh, it depends on the rules and regulations of your facility. Uh, but before you do this, uh, you might need to make sure that they are in a position to be restrained if you need to. Uh, because uh, the effect can be very dramatic. Of course, uh, the opiates have longer action than uh, the Narcan, and so it might wear off, and, and you might have to repeat the dose. And so this is essential, especially in um, a post, uh, post-surgical setting where you use a reversing agent to wake them up, and then after a time, it stops working and we need to carefully monitor them. You don't want to think that the reversing agent is going to have some kind of long-term effect because it won't. It usually is a very short effect, and if, the, if their uh, excessive dose is high enough, uh, we might need to monitor them very carefully and, and repeat that. We don't talk much about addiction in here, but uh, you need to know that the opiates, the benzodiazepines, the centrally acting sympathomimetics, and especially alcohol. These are very addictive substances and how to get people off of these medications is a, um, a lecture in and of itself, uh, but there is something in the clinical discussion section for you guys to take the time uh, to look into uh, how do we deal with addiction, especially ethanol. I think this is essential in the hospital because so many people end up having delirium tremens in the hospital that goes unrecognized and we don't treat that aggressively enough either. Uh, but I think that's more than enough for one day and my slides agree. When we come back we will talk about um, histamine, serotonin, the ergot alkaloids and the prostaglandins. So until then, aloha.